Never before has mankind faced so many questions, so much anxiety. Where is mankind headed? I used to believe in God. We believe that we are in the countdown to eternity now. I think a lot of times we're coming to the conclusion that there is no right or wrong. If ever there was a time when we need to be looking for the return of Jesus Christ, it is now. In the beginning, there was nothing. A vacuum, void, empty space. And in this empty space, there emerged a primordial fireball. Billions of years ago, this fireball exploded. This explosion generated all space, energy, matter. The universe expanded rapidly, producing electrons, neutrinos, photons, and quarks. Soon, this energy began interacting, forming protons and neutrons. Matter continued colliding and interacting. Over time, the first simple elements formed. These elements also collided as the primordial soup continued to expand. Cosmic and particulate evolution continued, and stars began to group, forming into the earliest galaxies. And then, just five billion years ago, something wondrous occurred. Within a cloud of gas in a spiral arm of the Milky Way galaxy, our sun formed. This new star gave birth to planets, moons, and asteroids. One of these planets, known as Earth, developed an atmosphere. Earth's environment, believed to be filled with volcanic eruptions, lightning, turbulent weather, mixed atoms and energy to create the first simple living cells. Then, through millions of years of mutations and natural selection, algae, jellyfish, and flatworms appeared. As evolution continued, fish appeared in the seas on planet Earth. Some of these fish developed into amphibians and through natural selection changed into reptiles. A segment of these reptiles evolved into a variety of creatures, including mammals. Some of these mammals became primates and then just 600,000 years ago, an isolated group of these primates evolved into man's earliest ancestors. This is our amazing evolutionary heritage. And evolution continues today as we evolve to our even higher destiny in the universe. Question of origins. How did the universe and all things that we see here on this planet come into being? Why do we exist? Hi, I'm Roger Oakland. Most of us have pondered these questions. And when it comes to the subject of origins, there are basically two views, the evolution theory and the creation theory. During the 20th century, the world was led to believe that evolution brought about all things. Our universe, 
the Earth and all life came into existence as a result of an explosion of matter in billions of years of time. However, there are others who believe the observable evidence points towards a creator. So how can we know? What does the observable evidence indicate? Both evolution and creation scientists have observed and agree that there is great variety within each species. Darwin noticed this variety and adaptability among finches. He noticed that the finch's beaks varied in size and shape, and that the beak's features affected the survivability of the finch. Today we notice a great variety of dogs. It is believed that all 450 breeds of dogs present today had a common ancestor. Most scientists believe that this ancestor was very similar to the present-day wolf. Scientists also witness natural selection, or survival of the fittest. Evolutionists and creationists agree that those animals that are the strongest, healthiest, or most adaptive to their environment are more likely to survive and go on to reproduce. The weaker animals, which are unable to adapt, are less likely to survive. We also observe gene mutations occurring. The DNA in all living organisms contains all the genetic information of life. Sometimes an error is introduced in this genetic code. This is called a mutation. Mutations often cause disease and can be induced by radiation, chemical agents, or replication errors. Mutations really do occur. They make all kinds of changes in genes. Uh, birth defects, disease, disease organisms, they're great at explaining the, the origin of disease, death, and disaster. Not at all at explaining the origin of something new, uh, some new trait that never exists. All the mutations we know about are only changes in genes that already exist. Darwin observed many things in, in nature. He was a good naturalist, a good observer of information. What he saw was various uh, plants and animals altering somewhat uh, through, through adaptation, through variation. Uh, he saw them uh, change. We never see one basic type of something changing into something else. That has never been observed in science or in, in genetics. It just has never been observed. What we see is variety. Variety happens, adaptation happens, evolution doesn't happen. Mutations, natural selection, adaptation. These are some of the observations that both evolutionists and creationists agree upon. But in spite of the agreements, there are substantial differences. And so the debate rages on. I mean, you have, you have such, such a wide variety of, of life. And I don't think it's possible for one person, I mean, no matter how powerful he might be, to just snap his fingers and create life. It has to come out naturally over millions of years, probably. Uh, I don't believe in the theory of evolution. Uh, you know, more and more, um, even secular scientists uh, are changing their viewpoints uh, because the evidence doesn't support their conclusions. Half of me believes in the theory of evolution, probably because that's what I was taught. Four years of studies, unfortunately, um, have kind of brainwash me towards evolution. We begin where evolutionists say it all began. With the Big Bang and the evolution of the universe. One interesting aspect of the evolutionary theory is that it's such, it's such a powerful theory and it's exercising such a strong hold over the imaginations of scientists that they've applied it outside the biological realm. They've applied it to inanimate things as well. They've applied it to the chemical elements, to stars, to galaxies. Uh, it's said that, um, that the universe itself is evolving. Did the Big Bang trigger the formation of galaxies, stars, planets, and ultimately, life? 
Is there any order coming out of a big explosion? I would say not in any way. Explosions cause chaos and random distribution of various parts that were there perhaps as a, a united organization beforehand. Any explosion re renders that completely null and void. There is no evidence to my mind that an explosion or even the Big Bang Theory can ultimately produce organized beings like ourselves or any other animal. Evolutionary thinking is applied to most areas of science. The field of evolutionary cosmology proposes that the universe is the result of a random explosion some 15 to 18 billion years ago. There are no examples that I've ever seen where an explosion produced an increase in order. Explosions are destructive. They cause spontaneous degeneration, not spontaneous generation. Scientists recognize that all known explosions decrease order and structure and increase chaos. The idea that the cosmos evolved also violates the second law of thermodynamics known as entropy. The second law states that as time advances, the universe becomes less ordered. Over time, all systems left on their own proceed in a direction from order to disorder. All of us witness entropy every day as we see things age and deteriorate. This breakdown of structure directly contradicts the theory of evolution. Now the second law allows you to increase in order like a baby growing into adulthood or seed into a tree but if and only if you have an outside energy source and a harnessing mechanism to capture that energy. Evolutionists don't have that. As Sagan said, the cosmos is all there is. There ain't no more. There is no outside energy source. So the second law is absolutely contradictory to the Big Bang Theory. What we see in cosmology is this. Everything we see, things are running down. Stars are burning up their fuel. Once in a while, a star will explode and goes from order to disorder very quickly. But the only thing we see in the universe today is the universe is running down. It's deteriorating. It's going from order to disorder. It's going to less and less organization. There is an observation that scientists make in every field of science. And it's generally called the laws of entropy. It's as if the universe was wound up somehow and is winding down. Scientists that study cosmology uh, talk about the ultimate heat death of the universe. Conceptually, it's quite clear from what we know that the universe ultimately sometime, billions of years from now, everything will become of uniform temperatures. There'll be no difference in temperature to exploit to get useful work. That the universe had to be designed and ordered in the finite past has not escaped the attention of secular scientists. NASA scientist Robert Jastrow wrote, The second law of thermodynamics applied to the cosmos indicates the universe is running down like a clock. If it is running down, there must have been a time when it was fully wound up. The next obvious question is, who wound it up? Gordon Van Wylen addressed the question squarely in his book, Thermodynamics, when he wrote, the author has found that the second law tends to increase his conviction that there is a creator who has the answer for the future destiny of man and the universe. We only see destruction, we never see innovation. And this, I think, is what the creationist model has been proposing all along, that in the beginning things were very good, they were perfect, just like God wanted. But then, as sin entered into the, to the universe and God's curse on all of creation because of that sin, the wages of sin is death, not only in the physical life, but in the universe, everything is dying. The, the sun is burning out, the moon's orbit is decaying. Everything is in this process of death and decay. Evolutionists and creationists agree now that the universe is finite. Space and time and matter had a beginning, beginning with the studies of Albert Einstein in the early 1900s on through this century, scientists are in agreement that space, time, and matter did indeed have a beginning. 20th century science, embarrassingly, has confirmed the, the biblical view because the great discovery in cosmology is that the experts have agreed that the universe had a beginning. And the, uh, they call it a singularity. You see, the whole Big Bang idea really is first there was nothing, and then it exploded. 
fact that the universe is finite, that it had a start, is a, is a key fact, but a very, very awkward fact uh, for the evolutionist because it really raises an issue they won't deal with, and that is what happened prior to that singularity. The creation model has always anticipated a finite universe. In the first verse of Genesis, we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible also states that time had a beginning. In 2 Timothy, we read, God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Amazingly, the Bible even explains entropy. Of old, you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment. If the universe did not originate from an explosion, the only other option is that it was created, an option that many scientists are not willing to consider. Almost all scientists would try to find a mechanical explanation of how the stars and the galaxies and the planetary system came into existence by purely mechanical means without any intervention of, um, of a god in creation. To my mind, they have utterly failed. If you look at the planetary system alone, there have been several explanations trying to uh, show how the planetary system came into existence without any preformation by God, and each one has failed uh, miserably. Many observations contradict the current theories on how the solar system evolved. The most popular theory holds that the solar system formed from an interstellar cloud of swirling gas and dust. If the sun, planets, and moons evolved from the same material, they should have many similarities. Yet each planet is unique. Since about 98% of the sun is hydrogen or helium, Earth, Mars, Venus, and Mercury should have similar compositions. Instead, much less than 1% of these planets is hydrogen or helium. If the solar system evolved, all planets should spin in the same direction. But Pluto and Venus rotate backwards, while Uranus is tipped on its side and rotates like a wheel. All moons in our solar system should orbit their planets in the same sense. But at least six have backward orbits. Furthermore, Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter have moons orbiting in both directions. Growing a planet by many small collisions will produce an almost non-spinning planet, since the impacts will be largely self-canceling. Yet, all planets spin, some much more than others. Growing a large, distant, gaseous planet such as Jupiter or Saturn poses an insurmountable hurdle for evolutionists because gases dissipate rapidly in the vacuum of outer space. And even young stars, similar to our sun, do not have enough orbiting hydrogen or helium to form even one Jupiter. Scientists have no answer as to why four planets have rings, or why each planet is so unique. Theories on the moon's origin are also completely inadequate. The moon's elements are too dissimilar to those of Earth's, and its orbital plane and circular orbit offer strong evidence that the moon was created in its present orbit. There is no evidence that the planetary system could have come about by mechanical means. However, the more that scientists began to look at the amazing universe that they inhabited, they began to realize that there were certain factors that were simply very, very fine-tuned for the existence of man, of molecules, of organic life. And the more they looked, the more they realized that we are in effect on really quite a knife edge. And there are many, many indications that this universe has been very specially designed and man is at the very center of it. If we try to model 
the universe as we know it, as we try to build a mathematical model that reflects what we know, we quickly discover there are thousands of parameters and ratios that if you adjust them even a little bit, life is impossible. We quickly discover that the Earth was a little closer, a little further from the sun. It's either too warm or too cold. If it turns at a little different speed, if the masses are a little different, it would hold too much or too little atmosphere. As you start trying to model this, you quickly discover that all the parameters involve an incredibly delicate balance. And so they call this the anthropic principle, meaning it's as if everything we know was skillfully designed or balanced for man. The Earth is at a very specific distance from the sun and I have calculated that if we were only 5% closer, the water would boil off from the oceans. If we were just 1% further away, then the oceans would freeze. And that gives you just some idea of what sort of a knife edge we are on. The surface gravity of the Earth is exactly where it needs to be. More, you have too much atmospheric pressure, less you don't have an atmosphere. Uh, the thickness of the crust is critical, the rotation period of the Earth the gravitational interaction between the moon, strangely enough, has to be, is all these contribute to what makes life possible. And so they call that the anthropic principle, which collectively is an overwhelming argument for a designer. Scientists don't like to acknowledge that because a designer implies accountability. That the Earth was fine-tuned for the existence of life is no surprise to creation scientists. The Bible declared this fact thousands of years ago. In Isaiah, we read, For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. Physicist and Nobel laureate Arno Penzia stated in 1992, Astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. Astronomer George Greenstein stated in his book, The Symbiotic Universe, as we survey all the evidence, the thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency must be involved. Is it possible that suddenly, without intending to, we have stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? The more we study the cosmos, the more the psalmist words ring true. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. For me to believe that all our life and our planets came from one big bang, I, I don't believe it. I believe, I believe there is a higher power out there. No, I do not believe that the universe has some sort of maker behind it. No, I believe the universe started with the Big Bang. I believe the Earth was designed for life because everything we see around us, everything we need to live, everything we need to survive and be happy is all around us. We don't, we don't want for anything, all our food, our air, everything to make us happy and to, for us to survive is here. So there had to be an originator of this. It couldn't just happen by, by chance. The evidence clearly reveals that God has created the universe and the solar system and specifically designed the Earth for life. Yet many would rather trust and believe in the Big Bang rather than trust and believe in the God of the Bible. In the next section, we'll examine the possibility of life arising from chemicals spontaneously. Did chemical evolution on the primordial Earth produce life? According to evolutionary thought, all life, bacteria, fish, plants, animals, and man, 
originated from chemical compounds. This theory that life arose from non-living chemicals is called spontaneous generation. One of the fundamental laws of uh, biology is the law of biogenesis, that life comes only from pre-existing life. And of course, for a creationist, that's certainly no surprise. Life, God's life, created life to multiply after its kind. So that makes sense to a creationist. But to an evolutionist, there was a time in the past when there wasn't any life. And so chemicals somehow got together and made living things. And, and this is, uh, was often called a spontaneous generation. And there have been some enormous problems faced in trying to get a group of chemicals to, to, to come to life. A few years ago, Stanley Miller did a, a famous experiment. He took some simple materials, uh, some methane, some ammonia, uh, some water vapor, uh, zotzed them with an electric spark to simulate lightning flashing back and forth in the atmosphere of the ancient Earth. And in just a week, he got amino acids, the building blocks of protein. And that was hailed as almost making life in a test tube. And that was one I used when I used to teach evolution. <laughs> but I took a look at the rest of the evidence. And there are three problems with that brilliant experiment. One, he had the wrong starting materials. Uh, two, he used the wrong conditions. And three, he got the wrong results. Other than that, it was a brilliant experiment. The Miller experiment assumed an atmosphere of methane and ammonia, gases that could not have been present in large amounts because the ammonia would be decomposed by ultraviolet light. And methane should be found stuck to ancient sedimentary clays, but is not. Miller also left out oxygen because he knew that oxygen would destroy the very molecules he was trying to produce. But as deep as we dig, we find oxidized rocks, suggesting an oxygen-rich atmosphere. The Earth did not have a reducing atmosphere, say an atmosphere of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen that was suggested in the Stanley Miller experiment. Uh, they never, the Earth never had such an atmosphere. The, Geology is now clear. There is good evidence that the Earth has always had oxygen in its atmosphere. Now that would absolutely preclude any evolutionary origin of life. Miller also used the wrong conditions. He used an electric spark to combine the gas molecules. The problem is that the same spark that puts amino acids together also tears them apart and it's much better at destroying them than making them. The problem was the, the chemicals put together, the amino acids in the flask, would also be torn apart by the very spark that put them together. Miller knew that as a biochemist, and so he circulated the gases, trapped out the molecules he wanted using a well-known biochemist trick, but that would be cheating because you were supposed to say this is how life arose before there was an, any intelligent design to preserve these molecules from that destructive force, wrong conditions. Then he got the wrong results. The main product of the Miller experiment was tar, a nuisance in organic reactions. Trace amounts of several amino acids that make up the proteins in living things were also produced. The problem is that Miller's experiment produced both left-handed and right-handed amino acids. Only left-handed amino acids make up the proteins of life, and just one right-handed molecule prevents their production. What Miller actually produced was a poisonous brew that would destroy any hope for the chemical evolution of life. You might say, well, if what I've just said is true, what about all the evolutionists that believe in this? Well, interestingly enough, the evolutionists would agree with me. Uh, there was a time I was at a debate at San Diego State University. I was just in the audience. But uh, two friends of mine, Dr. Henry Morris and Dr. Dwayne Gish, were doing the debate for the creationists. And at the end, uh, somebody in the audience noted, ladies and gentlemen, we're privileged this evening. We have in our audience Dr. Stanley Miller. And Gish had explained why Miller's experiment would not produce life from non-life. And so the, the person asked Dr. Miller, would you like to respond to what Dr. Gish said about your experiments for chemical evolution? And Dr. Miller said, no. <laughs> he hasn't believed in that for decades. He knows all of those same problems. I would say this, any theory on the origin of life on the Earth, or any other planet as far as that's concerned, is a fairy tale. Evolution teaches that energy, such as lightning or heat, plus matter, 
can occasionally create new life. Yet our entire food industry rests on the fact that this can never happen. If we examine a jar of peanut butter, it contains matter and is exposed to light and heat. But we never find new life inside unless an outside life contaminates it. If the theory of evolution was viable, then I should occasionally by subjecting this to energy, end up having new life. Now we go down to the store, and um, if, if I open this jar of peanut butter, maybe not often, but on some occasion, I should find new life inside. And so, when we open the jar of peanut butter, we look in there, there's no new life. <laughs> And aren't you glad, okay? Now, um, you may smile at this, but hopefully you'll never forget it because you and I conduct, uh, collectively, over a billion experiments every year, and we've done that for virtually a hundred years, and we never encounter new life. In fact, the entire food industry of the world depends on the fact that evolution doesn't happen. The case for chemical evolution only weakens when we consider that long chains of specific amino acids all in exactly the right position are required to form the proteins of life. Even worse, amino acids do not naturally link up to form proteins, but rather tend to break down. Now, proteins can be two or 3,000 amino acids long, very long, complex chemicals. And they're very much like a computer program. Every amino acid has to be in exactly the right position. If one of them is wrong, then the whole um, protein is useless, just like a computer program. The improbabilities buried in Darwinism start right at the very beginning, even before life began. How did, uh, how did the first protein molecule come about? And there's been quite a bit of work done on this to investigate the probability of it, um, work both by information theory technologists and also by um, molecular biologists actually tinkering with proteins to see whether or not they can be taken to pieces and reassembled. And the work of um, both groups has found that the probability of a, a protein of the sort of size that you find in the human body coming about by chance is so great as to be virtually impossible. It's something which is, yes, it is possible if you have eternity at your disposal, but Darwinists just don't have eternity at their disposal. Information theory scientist Hubert Yockey calculated and MIT biologist Robert Sauer confirmed that the probability that a protein containing just 100 amino acids would form spontaneously is less than one chance in 10 to the 65th power. An event so improbable that it could be compared to winning the state lottery by finding the winning ticket in the street and then continuing to find the winning ticket in the street every week for a thousand years. The origin of the very first animal life out of ordinary complex chemicals is so large that no evolutionist has ever been able to overcome it and it is one of the biggest barriers to the theory of evolution that I know. Even if proteins miraculously formed, we still are not close to producing life. The simplest living cells require thousands of specialized proteins in order to function. A number of scientists have tried to calculate the probability of life arising by chance. Sir Fred Hoyle, a British mathematician, using a supercomputer and the assistance of graduate students, estimated only the origin of the proteins of an amoeba, 2,000 of them, arising by chance. He estimated that the probability that the proteins of an amoeba could arise by chance is one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power. A probability of one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power is absurdly small. To illustrate this, consider the probability of snatching a particular atom out of the entire universe is one chance in 10 to the 80th power. After making this calculation, British mathematician Sir Frederick Hoyle stated, the likelihood of the formation of life from inanimate matter is one to a number with 40,000 noughts after it.
it is enough to bury Darwin and the whole theory of evolution. There was no primeval soup, neither on this planet nor any other. And if the beginnings of life were not random, they must therefore have been the product of purposeful intelligence. We can prove mathematically that evolution is, is just a joke. It couldn't possibly happen. Richard Dawkins, for example, uh, one of the leading evolutionists in his book, of the blind watchmaker. He acknowledges that the nucleus of every cell, plant, animal, or human, has a database larger than the 30 volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. All life, plants, animals, and man, are made up of cells. Each cell is a miniaturized city performing the complex functions required for life to exist. The cell membrane is self-repairing and consists of special proteins that monitor what is outside of the cell as well as select which molecules are allowed to enter. These proteins act as pumping stations, controlling the import of nutrients and the export of waste materials. Inside the cell, we find staggering complexity. For example, the endoplasmic reticulum is a transportation network with protein-producing factories called ribosomes. The ribosomes produce many types of specific proteins, while the ER channels them to precise locations. The Golgi bodies transport proteins to the exterior membrane, while lysosomes act as digestive organs that break down and recycle larger molecules into particles the cell can use. The mitochondria are the power plants of the cell, producing the fuel that the cell consumes. The nucleus contains the data center, which governs cell activity. Inside the nucleus, we find the chromosomes, which contain the DNA molecule that functions as a library and contains all the coded information needed for life. Billions of instructions are coded on this error-detecting and error-correcting self-replicating molecule. Only if all of these structures were created simultaneously could a cell function. For example, to produce DNA, a cell requires more than 75 different types of proteins. Yet these proteins are only produced at the direction of DNA. The only solution to this dilemma is creation. The odds of getting DNA making protein on a roll of the molecular dice is like the odds of getting a 13 on a pair of gaming dice. The potential is not there. The probability is just plain zero. Evolution teaches that bacteria were one of the first life forms to evolve from chemicals. Many bacteria propel themselves with a type of miniature motor called a flagellum. These extremely efficient reversible motors rotate up to 100,000 revolutions per minute. The bacterial motor is similar to an electric motor. It has a filament that acts as a propeller, a universal joint, a stator and a rotor, and a drive shaft with bushings. Each part of the motor must function or the bacteria will die. Since bacteria can start, stop, and change direction and speeds, they must have sophisticated sensors, switches, and control mechanisms. All of this is highly miniaturized. Eight million of these motors would fit in the cross-sectional area of a human hair. While bacteria are small, they are not simple. You know, I think probably the weakest link in all of evolution theory is the idea of the origin of life from non-living chemicals it's probably easier to get from a cell to a person than it is to get from chemicals to life. Uh, the, the gap there is just so incredibly large. I'm convinced that life is so complicated, so complex, so intricately engineered that wherever life exists, God created it. It could not have come by natural processes. Life comes from a creator, and that creator tells us that he created life here on Earth. Here we see it, unimaginably complex, it must have been created. 
I believe humans evolved to where we are today from single-celled organisms based on the, the theory of Darwinism and natural selection. I don't think that there was any sort of divine intervention. I believe evolution is um, pretty much a proven theory. I don't believe in a higher order. Um, just because the fact that I haven't seen any, you know, proof or, you know, concrete evidence of that, and until somebody shows me, know that there is, then I'm going to have an inversion to organized religion, and I'm going to stay on the basis of chemical evolution. No life is simple, and all life shows the handiwork of a designer. Scientists know this, yet many believe in chemical evolution rather than be accountable to the creator God of the Bible. Next we will examine the evolutionary view that simple life has evolved into complex life. Assuming that life miraculously appeared on Earth, is it possible that single-cell life evolved to become all the complex plants and animals we see today? That was Darwin's idea that everything, every living thing on the Earth, eventually could be traced back to a common ancestor. The thing that Darwinists believe is that life, that all the species on Earth have evolved by a process of spontaneous genetic mutation, that's a spontaneous change in the DNA which is the program for every living thing, coupled with natural selection, the survival of the fittest. The extraordinary thing is that although the theory has been pretty well accepted universally for over a century now, there is absolutely no direct evidence to support it at all. Darwin made a big deal about the fact that there were various sizes of finches, small, large, medium-sized finches. He made a big deal of the fact that there were finches with uh, large beaks, thick beaks, long beaks, and thin beaks. Darwin assumed that these beaks were evidence of evolution. In fact, these beaks were the result of the genetic variability that already existed in the population. If you take two medium finches with medium-sized beaks, and you breed them, you will get some finches with small beaks and some finches with larger beaks. Over time, as these finches spread out into the various environments, certain beak sizes would be favored in certain environments and therefore they would become the predominant type. But the point is, is the capability to produce the small beaks, the medium beaks, and the large beaks was already in the parent population of the Galapagos finches. And it was simply the environmental differences that allowed them to be expressed. It was not the creation of any new and unique information. The trouble is that all these finches actually do interbreed. And that is the, in biology, this is the test of a, a species. Uh, two creatures which can breed and uh, produce live fertile young are regarded as being belonging to the same species and all the Galapagos finches meet that criterion so they are not many many species. If evolution was true we wouldn't be concerned about the extinction of species there'd be new ones being created we don't have two species we got deterioration we have all kinds of species that no longer exist. Charles Darwin theorized that given enough time one kind of animal could evolve into another. This is the basis for the evolutionary tree of life taught in biology. Yet Darwin himself acknowledged the lack of transitional fossils in the rock strata. Darwin wrote, intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. And this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against the theory. The key problem with Darwinism is finding hard physical evidence. Where would you look for that evidence? Well, obviously in the rocks, in the, the record of the rocks, the fossil record. Fossils have been collected for hundreds of years, for centuries. There are billions of fossils in every university and every museum in the world. But there are no intermediate species. You look at one strata and you find one kind of fossil. You look at the strata above it, you find a different kind of fossil. You don't find, what you don't find is a gradual change. One of the greatest evidences for creation is found in the fossil record. For example, in the so-called Cambrian rocks, we find a, uh, fossils of a vast array of very complex invertebrates, clams, snails, jellyfish, worms, brachiopods, trilobites, and many other very complex invertebrates. 
But nowhere on the face of this earth has anyone found fossilized ancestors to a single one of those complex invertebrates. Now that fact alone demolishes the theory of evolution. Evolutionists claim that these invertebrates in turn evolved into vertebrates, such as fish. However, over the last 150 years, scientists have unearthed billions of invertebrate and vertebrate fossils and they have not found a single transitional form. Every major kind of fish that we know anything about appears fully formed, no trace of ancestors, and certainly no trace of transitional form linking these major kind of fishes to one another. Now that fact is known. Evolutionists know that. Now the fact that we have no ancestors for the fishes, the vertebrates, we have no ancestors for the invertebrates, means that we didn't have any ancestors, and evolution is impossible. A study of the geological record confirms that the major groups of animals each appear abruptly and fully formed. For example, within the insect world, there is enormous variety and complexity. Yet evolutionists offer no conclusive evidence that any of the insects evolved from a common ancestor. The same problem exists for all of the great variety of amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. The evolutionary tree of life has no trunk nor branches. Therefore, all of the implied intermediates are only blind speculation. Sometimes um, Darwinists hold up examples of what they say are transitions. For example, I suppose the, the best known example is Archaeopteryx, which appears to be half dinosaur, half bird. The trouble is, when you look at the dinosaurs that it might have evolved from, what you find is that none of those dinosaurs had a collarbone, and birds all do have a keeled breastbone which holds the pectoral muscles, which enables it to flap its wings. It has been claimed in the past that their Archaeopteryx was really nothing more than a feathered reptile. Well, I've never seen a reptile yet that you just stick a bunch of feathers in and kick it in the tail and it flies. And no, Archaeopteryx flew. He had wings and he certainly wasn't a feathered reptile. As a matter of fact, I have an article here before me published in March 1996 in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology. And the authors say this, the avian features of the skull demonstrate that Archaeopteryx is a bird rather than a feathered non-avian archosaur. The most important missing link of all, of course, is the missing link between an ape-like ancestor and mankind. That's the missing link that most of us are interested in. Have, have we found that? Well, if you listen to Darwinists, you'd think that we found lots of them. In fact, the evidence really isn't there at all. All of the fossils that have been found so far have been classified, reclassified, either as human or as ape. And so far, the missing link is still missing. I have been investigating the so-called missing link between man and ape for many years and I have found that every single one of them um, simply is no link whatsoever. For example, Australopithecus, the uh, skeleton of Lucy, this really consists only of a 40% skeleton of a not very large ape and they have not got any evidence that it ever walked upright in any of the bones that they have found of that skeleton. The interesting thing about that is that Lucy is shown as being distinctly human-like. She's very erect in her posture, she's got human-like hands, human-like feet. Uh, I'm not quite sure where exactly the restorers got this data from because if you examine the paper by Randall and Sussman which describes the type species to which Lucy belongs, they said quite clearly that she had long curved hands and feet, even longer and even more curved than a chimpanzee. Um, several distinguished anatomists have reached the conclusion that, for example, Australopithecus, the genus to which Lucy belongs, was simply an extinct ape, nothing at all to do with humans. If we analyze the so-called missing links, we find a trail of fraud, deception, and speculation. For example, Nebraska man was reconstructed, family and all, from an extinct pig's tooth. Piltdown Man is now universally known to be a deliberate hoax, consisting of an ape's jaw and a human skull doctored to look old. Neanderthals were just plain people, some of which suffered from arthritis, rickets, or syphilis. Ramapithecus, 
Gigantopithecus and Zygantropus were just apes, while Heidelberg Man and Cro-Magnon were completely human. So, despite evolutionists' misleading claims, the missing link is still missing. One of the more amusing things you hear these days is that uh, the DNA of man and chimpanzees is 98.3% identical. And I have to admit, as a geneticist, I find that kind of humorous, that you're not even that closely related to yourself. And so the genes you inherit from your mother, the genes you inherit from your uh, father, uh, are on the average, at a maximum, only 93% similar. Scientists claim that the hemoglobin of a chimpanzee is 98% the same as the hemoglobin of a human being. What they don't tell you is there are many other organisms, including slime molds, that have hemoglobin, which is also very similar to the hemoglobin of a human being. Now, you would expect a lot of similarities between man and chimpanzee. We breathe the same air, we have muscles and bones, we digest things similarly. If we were created by the same God, we would expect to have lots of similarities. But let's suppose for just a moment that there, there was some truth in that figure. Oh, I've got a clue where in the world it could have come from. Uh, a cloud is 98% water. A jellyfish is 98% water. A watermelon is 98% water. To use evolutionary logic, there's no difference between a cloud, a jellyfish, and a watermelon. <laughs> Those 2% difference really make a whale of a difference uh, in man and chimpanzee. In the first chapter of Genesis, we are told that God created every living thing according to its own kind to reproduce and fill the earth. This is exactly what we see. If, as evolutionists claim, a reptile evolved into a bird, who would the first bird mate with? Furthermore, all intermediate forms would be fatal. What good is half a wing? or half a beak. All animals have complex organs required for their survival. For instance, dolphins and bats have a sophisticated sonar that they use to locate food. Unless these highly efficient sonar systems are fully functional, the animal dies. Certainly, the scientific evidence overwhelmingly supports the creation model while evolutionists are forced to admit that from their perspective, both the origin of life and the origin of the major groups of animals remain unknown. Complex body structures that we have probably did not come from the evolution. Maybe it did. It's really hard to decide which one it could be. To me, again, it takes more faith to believe that all these perfect conditions came together at the right moment to allow all these complex aspects of life to, to come into being and to come into existence. And to me, there's, it takes a lot more faith to believe that hogwash than it does to believe that there's an awesome God that created us. Evolutionists are trying desperately to hold on to a failing theory rather than to acknowledge the creator God of the Bible. Despite this, the evidence continues to mount to support the creation model. But how can we know that the God of the Bible is the creator? The scientific evidence in this century has indeed proven that space, time, and matter is finite, and it tells us that the creator must be a being who's independent of space and time. Only the Bible teaches the notion of a finite universe and a creator who is fully transcendent. That is, he's independent of space and time, but he can also act within a space-time domain. No other holy book on the earth teaches such a creator. If you look at any of the other religious books, all of them present, presume, a three-dimensional universe and a three-dimensional God. And that's amazing so to realize that only the Bible has, as its distinctiveness, a transcendent presentation. For years, the astronomers believed that there was somewhere in the neighborhood of 6,000 stars. This held in the science of astronomy until Galileo came along with his telescope. And suddenly, science realized that the stars of the heaven are innumerable. Billions of galaxies, billions of stars in these galaxies, innumerable, just like God said to Abraham 
way back in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Throughout the Bible, we find insights about the physical universe that the scientific world has only recently discovered. For instance, in the book of Jonah, we read, The water compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. In this amazing verse, we are told that there are mountains on the ocean floor. Yet scientists did not know this until this century. In the book of Job, Job proclaims that God hangs the earth on nothing. While many holy books declared that the earth sits on the backs of turtles or elephants or is held up by Atlas, the Bible alone declares what we now know to be true. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, we read, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Only recently have scientists discovered that everything in the universe is made up of subatomic particles that are indeed invisible to the naked eye. Certainly these authors were inspired by the creator of the universe. Many other scientific insights were revealed in the Bible centuries before man discovered them. For example, Atomic fission, oceanic currents, the hydrologic cycle, the jet stream, dinosaurs, and innumerable stars. We know that when Columbus made his trip to discover India and landed here in America, that uh, when he took off, uh, there was tremendous fears that he would come to the edge of the earth and would plunge off into nothing. And yet, had they read the Bible, they would have known that Isaiah talks about the circle of the earth and that the earth is actually round. I challenge anyone to find scientific errors in the Bible. They're not there. What's fascinating to me is the more you know about the scripture and the more you know about contemporary science, you discover that the Bible has anticipated. As a Christian, we can believe in creation and the laws of science at the same time. And as a scientist, I'd a lot rather believe a theory that fits with the evidence that we can really see. Always, whenever we study, whenever we really can observe, we'll see that science supports God's Word. I would challenge those who are declaring that the Bible is filled with myths to investigate for yourself with an open mind I know you'll discover the truth. A question of origins. We've examined the evidence. Now it's up to you as an individual to make a choice. In the book of Romans chapter 1, the Bible tells us that the evidence that God has created is so obvious from the things that God has made that if you reject that evidence, you are without excuse. And in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, the Bible tells us who the Creator is. Not only that He has created all things, but that He has redeemed us from our sins through His death upon the cross at Calvary. The Creator is Jesus Christ. Will you acknowledge that you have been created? Will you recognize that you have been separated from the Creator, Jesus Christ, because of your sins? Will you accept Him, who He is, and what He's done? and who you are and what you've done, it will be the greatest choice that you could ever make for eternity.